Welcome to the Leader Growth Podcast. I'm David Skidmore. This podcast is designed to help you overcome challenges and experience transformation. If you haven't yet, would you rate this podcast, review it, subscribe to it, and share it with someone you know it can help? Well, a lot of leaders admire the entrepreneurial spirit of a few. You know, entrepreneurship is something that it can unlock a lot of opportunity in your life as a leader. And when it comes to leading as an entrepreneur, I wanted to sit down with someone who does this so well in his life. I've seen him do this throughout many different businesses, opportunities, and it's just simply how he views all of life, I think. That's how I would describe my friend, Drake Cyphers. Drake, thanks for joining us today on the Leader Growth Podcast. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, so we've known each other for... I think it's about six years now. Yeah, that sounds right about right. Technically, we went to college together, Yeah, but we didn't really, maybe we waved at each other once or something, but yeah. yeah. But we met Salt Night Leadership Training 2016 at a ranch in the middle of nowhere in Oklahoma. And we were just talking about this at at the beginning. Early on, I wasn't too sure if you liked me. That's just my face. I, I always have to joke with people, like, my general demeanor is just very serious so yeah I, my thinking face is just like <laughs> you are a focused guy i look like that and people are like well, what are you thinking about like, it could be puppies it could be skittles it could be literally anything but that's just my face but my experience like, with you is usually you're thinking about something that is 5 10 15 years down the, <laughs> yeah that's usually what it is but down the road and there's a lot of opportunity yeah. connected to it yeah usually that's i like to think about where things are going and how they'll get there. Yeah. And it's just kind of weird. I've always been able to kind of just walk into a situation or an organization. And it's kind of like the movie, The Matrix, where I just feel like I can read The Matrix, like everything just pops out at me. And you just read it and it's like, okay, here's what's good, here's what's bad, here where there's where they're struggling, here's where this is breaking down, this is breaking down, this is breaking down. That's just a gift. Like God just gave me that gift because even like my senior year in college, I had two jobs and an internship and a full load of school, and I was helping a real estate broker. And I saved him like a hundred grand on his business. <laughs> and he's in his 40s, everyone's an adult there. And I just walked in and was like, Oh, you do this, 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 and this. And we fix it. Yeah. And he was like, You just saved me like a hundred grand. I was like, Cool, let's go do some other stuff. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I do remember even in our early conversations was how you would talk about different challenges and you're able to assess and assimilate information really quickly to to a point that I don't think that everybody's playing with that same toolbox Mm -hmm. that that you're playing with. I I, want to step back, though, in your journey, the entrepreneurship. Where did this really come from? Mm, I don't really like rules. In my first business, it really just started from opportunity. So my first job, I was 13. And the place where my dad worked, they were, it was a hardware distributorship. And so you had display boards you had to put together, they had to put together. And they were like, why don't we get, just get a kid to do this? We can pay him minimum wage and he can do yeah. it. And I really wanted an Xbox. So that was a dream job for me. I was like, yes. I'll go make 600 bucks. They don't have to report in taxes and we're set. Yeah. But then they came to me a little, late, a little later and they were like, hey, the person who was washing all the trucks quit. Is that something Drake might be interested in doing? And so I was homeschooled, so I have a completely flexible schedule. So I started washing the trucks, and the natural next step of that was starting to wash people's cars. And so I would just get there, wash the trucks, and then line up people who wanted their cars washed. And they're at work. They can get their car washed. They come out to a clean car at the end of the day. So that was where it started. Um, I didn't look at entrepreneurship as like its own thing. It was just, I was graduating from school and I was bored in school. So I was getting my finance degree and I was studying digital marketing on the side and just had an opportunity come up. It was actually kind of interesting. I had a guy, I had talked to Chris a little bit before my best friend about- Chris Murray. Yeah, I was talking to him, I was like, oh man, it'd be cool. You know how to make websites. You make the websites. I can sell the websites. Yeah. Which I don't know where that came from. I just was from reading all these, studying all these online blogs and podcasts on how to do that. I was like, oh, okay, cool. We can do yeah. this. And the owner of that same commercial real estate firm, he was driving down to Dallas to 
get something, get a listing and do a few other things. And he was like, does anybody want to go with me? And everyone was also like, no, I don't want to do that. And I was looking like, wait, you mean I get to sit with this guy for three hours, six hours actually, mm-hmm. there and back to try and prove I'm worth something and make something happen? I'm in. I'm in. And so, yeah. Yes. So jump in and we're just talking. And as you do on road trips, stuff comes up and he was talking about this website that he had gotten a bid to do because he had all of his brokers this was like the first ipad so the old mm-hmm. big thick chunky oh, yeah. like ipad he had just gotten all his brokers ipads because he was like this is going to be the future of computing i was like okay yeah cool and he's like i got a website that i want our website to work on the ipads i got a bid for 33 grand to do it and he was just talking about it and i was like i'll do it for 20 and i was like okay I've, and at the time, I had built yeah. a, the number of websites I had built was zero. I had zero websites. But you knew someone who but could I, build I was a like, website. I knew someone who could, and I was like, for twenty thousand dollars, I should. Which that's an insane amount of money to me at that time. Oh yeah. And I'm like, for twenty grand, I'll figure it out. Like, yeah. I will. I'll figure it out. And so, it wasn't even really. It wasn't even really about actually like thinking. Oh, I'm an entrepreneur. It was just like, here's an opportunity. We're gonna do this, and just yeah. start the business. And I went to Chris. I was like, hey. Let's do this. We got this done. And so technically by the end of the trip, I had the $20,000 website and I had gotten him to agree to pay Chris and my living expenses for the rest of the year for us to do marketing services in addition to the website that we were building. Okay. So I I have to pause just right here and say, if you're someone who looks at entrepreneurship and it's really complicated, it's actually as simple as looking Mm -hmm. and seeing an opportunity Mm -hmm. and then taking one step. You literally took one step. Oh, yeah. We might even say you took two because getting <laughs> in the car, that's a step. And then two is we can do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The entire yeah. the entire premise of our economic system is people have something that they want done and there are people who do it. Like mm-hmm. literally you grow oranges, I want oranges. Yeah. And then we use money as a medium to exchange. We used to do barter system where you had oranges and I had a uh, piece of wood that you needed for to make a bench out of or I had a bench yeah you trade me oranges for benches money just abstracted that and said here's the time it's a real value we can both produce it allow specialization but really somebody wants something done or wants a product and someone will fulfill that that's literally all it is so if you have somebody who wants anything that you can do that is it I mean that's and then it's are you doing it for someone else where they're taking the company owners taking the risk yeah of putting all the systems together and you're just helping fulfill that or are you the one who just does the whole thing? And that is a two-minute masterclass on entrepreneurship <laughs> from Drake Cyphers. So you and Chris, you start off on this business endeavor, right? Have you even graduated at this point? Barely. When we started doing that, I don't know if we had, but I knew it was within months. Okay. So it was like within months of us graduating, okay. we started going that way. So it's you and Chris. And then at some point, there's a third compadre, Mm -hmm. third amigo who joins (laughs) into this band of brothers. So how it worked, if I remember right, was, yeah. So we turns out the website that we wanted to build was a bit more advanced than what Chris could do. Mm -hmm. So we found a developer and we paid the developer. And then we needed to do some video content. So we found someone Chris knew who could do really good video content and... From there, it was just like, all right, now we got to go get more clients. We got to go figure out how to do all this stuff and put it together. And so it just evolved step by step into having more people. And then I think it was a year, I think it was a year later. And then we brought, we realized that we needed to bump up our graphic design. And so that's when we brought Jacob Weaver. Um, Jacob Weaver came in with us. And then, yeah, so just step by step. You know, just trying to figure it out, which that's not normally you start an advertising agency by going to work in an ad agency. You work at the ad agency, you develop some relationships with the clients, and then the clients are a little bit unhappy with the big agency. You Mm -hmm. go, oh, I could do this better, so I'll step out on my own and do it. We had done advertising. We had not done any of that. Yeah. And so it was kind of a weird, you know, build it while you fly kind of a situation where, you know, ready, take off, all right, now build it while I'm falling to the ground, trying to fly this thing. And eventually, Mm -hmm. it's flying, and it's doing really well, which, as time went on, though, you ended up uh, shifting into some different things. Chris has it as well, as Mm -hmm. has Jacob. And Mm -hmm. so, what has your entrepreneurial journey been like? 
So there was the first the first business at 16, which grew that a little bit, had an employee. It was just a cute little high school business. Yeah. And then worked jobs through college, serving waiting tables, which was mm-hmm. great for sales. If anybody is trying to bump up their sales and they're like, they're young, get a job. I sold cars, but really waiting tables at a good spot that will teach you how to do it. You can learn tons about sales from that. But yeah. Then we started the digital agency, Chris and I, and then he bought me out of that and I sold off, sold my shares to him. And then I went and worked for a commercial real estate development company where they're you know, building stuff. And every one of those projects is kind of like a micro business that you're building there. We built some houses and then I built an RV park, which was an entire RV park that had wow, to stand yeah. up, had to ended up about, about 25% of the way through the project having to take over the project and GC it. And I mm-hmm. hadn't GC'd anything before. So I'm having to play general contractor yeah. and organize that while doing all the bank interfacing and the loan interfacing, setting up all the operations, all the marketing and branding, and then the convenience store that we had on site, you know, figuring out how do you set up a convenience store? Mm-hmm. How do you stock it? How do you have all the software in place? How yeah. do you train the employees? How do you, it's all that stuff. So even though I was technically working for someone that was rather entrepreneurial, and then did a little bit of private equity consulting with a group. And then I had my last company, which was an internet service provider that I took from idea. The genesis, original genesis mm-hmm. of that idea was while I was at the RV park. And then yeah, took that, started it, and then just sold it and finished work for the acquired to work for the acquirer for a little bit. I worked for them until what, December 10th of 2021. And since so. then you have been a free man. Yeah. No, I've been so, resting, which I is I've never really done before. Yeah, I remember um, in January you told mm-hmm. me I, I saw you at Chris's Christmas party, and you said, "Yeah, it looks like I'm going to be resting." And I said, "We'll see how long that goes." <laughs> I've been impressed. Yeah, with well, so for me, resting means what are you going to do? I'm going to jump into tr- cryptocurrency mm-hmm. trading and learning all about cryptocurrency. So yeah. I realized that there's a certain element of stress that I need in my life in order mm-hmm. to function. Yeah. But I've been mostly resting. <laughs> well, you know, it's something you enjoy. It's given you like an opportunity to step back and assess mm-hmm. and even look at, you know, what does the future look like? Mm-hmm. I think is part of the, hopefully, the entrepreneurial mm-hmm. reward yeah. is being able to do something and then maybe you do want to sell it and mm-hmm. then step back and actually consider this is a new future that mm-hmm. I want to create. So let's go ahead and look at the, at the space and time between RV Park and uh, Skyber. What are we looking at between that idea and it becoming a business. So originally what had happened was I was, so I was building this RV park, it was up at Grand Lake. So relatively remote location, cell phone coverage wasn't, what is, I had to drive 10 minutes to be able to make a phone call, which is yeah. millennial hell. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> and the internet sucked everywhere on the island. You could have a 20 minute conversation with anybody. Yeah. Like, hi, how are you doing? I know we're strangers. Tell me if your internet working and just 20 minutes of ranting. And so I was like, huh, I bet there's other small communities mm-hmm. who would, this is an issue. So I called a buddy of mine that I had been, friends with for a while and he had been in telecommunications and was he was CEO of a publicly traded telecommunications company and I was like, Hey man, I know you're done with that. You've you're a disabled vet. There's around here, the internet's awful. There's a company though that got a bunch of government loans and grants from the USDA. Mm-hmm you're a disabled vet, you should qualify really well for those. So it would be interesting for you to look at, you know, setting up an internet service provider to where you could do this. And he was like, you know, I thought about doing something like that at some point, but that's a pretty good idea. So he kind of takes that ball and rolls Mm -hmm. with it. I'm finishing up the RV park and finishing up the RV park, working on that. And then I took my little short stint doing some private equity stuff and some consulting. And he... We'd actually, the consulting group had, uh, was talking to him about it, but he's like, I really need just somebody to help me Mm. get this off the ground. And so he asked me to come on. And so I came on, I redid all the financial performa data, you know, did all our financial forecasts and all the marketing materials. We came up with a new name and I went and did kind of the roadshow to go try and raise the money and ended up raising, raising some money from... Uh, a guy named Ken Parker, 
amazing, mm-hmm. amazing man. Yeah. And then we're off. We got the money. Now we got to go build it and execute. So, you know, one of the things that before we jumped into this conversation, Chris Murray said mm-hmm. is he said, Drake has such a unique perspective on capital, <laughs> you know, and raising capital. And how do you actually move things forward? So help me understand a little bit of your approach to it. So you have to consider the times that we're in. So we've got Venture capital has just taken off. Everybody's, you know, Uber's getting multi-billion dollar valuation. Mm -hmm. The traditional route that goes is, you know, go raise a bunch of money so you can execute on this project. So people see that. And I think it was something Brian Clifton said where entrepreneurs are kind of the new rock stars. So, you know, people may not want to be a basketball player anymore, but they want to be an entrepreneur. They want to be that guy that makes it. And people think, okay, so I have my idea I've got my idea. Now I just need to go raise money and then take the idea. And the reality is money is just an accelerant. And so, you know, if you have a fire and you pour accelerant on it, it's just going to make it burn hotter and faster. Mm -hmm. And instead, people raise all this money. What they don't realize is that you have to pay that money back if you want to keep doing things. And so I think capital is important, but I think that people don't nurture their ideas enough and Mm -hmm. try and figure out how to do some of it quickly because product market fit is one of the most important things to have if you have a startup and the product market fit do people want what i'm bringing to the market so does it fit in the market and a lot of times people will go raise a bunch of money for this idea that they think is really cool while they're trying to find product market fit. And like I said, money's like an accelerant. If you're going the right direction and you happen to Mm -hmm. get it, it can get you going where you're going a lot faster. But if you're going the wrong direction, it can drive you off a cliff really quickly. Yeah. And then now you're much further along in the process. You have to, let's say, rebuild something, and now you have this debt service that you're having to make or you're having to go go raise money. And if you have multiple stages of fundraising, if you have a down round, well, that can really alter the mm-hmm. trajectory of your business in a negative way. Whereas some people, especially with all the tools available now, if they had just taken some time to try and build it cheaply, at least an initial minimum viable product, build it yes. really cheaply, test it with some people, and get some initial traction, then going and raising the money, one, is way easier because you're not trying to go, hey, I've got this pie in the sky idea. I know I haven't done this before, but I can yeah. do it. Rather than doing that, they're going, here's my business. Here's what we're showing. Here are the things that I figured out that are the wrong way to do this, and this is what I think is the right way to do this. And it's much easier for someone to onboard and to jump on and write you a check knowing that you've put some effort into it already versus just having this ethereal idea. Which leads to this whole process when – you know, entrepreneurs are known for facing fears, being out. I think when we talk about business, you never seemed intimidated when you've looked at, like, how does business work? But I do know that this past entrepreneurial endeavor led to you having to step in and face some of your fears. Yeah, yeah I think that, you know, fear is an interesting thing. With this one specifically, there were all sorts of fears that, I had, whether it be like physical fears or just the mental, the mental fear that having the crazy pressures Mm -hmm. on you because, and that's, has partially shaped my ideas about capital and the fundraising structure because I feel very responsible, you know, for returning money to Mm -hmm. investors to, to be able to make them whole and to not just lose everything. And then with the with the startup. So we kind of, so we got started, you know, we've got this money. Cool. We're going to go build our original network, which you build an internet, it's an internet service provider in case anybody doesn't know, you've got a confined geographical area and you have to build out your network to be able to cover that area and building out that area. There's a certain relatively high fixed cost to go and do that because you need towers. Essentially you put Mm -hmm. antennas on tall towers Then you broadcast to other antennas that are on houses and you connect the internet there. Then you run the wire into the house and now they have internet. So it's a wireless internet service provider. When we built it, we built it because we had all this money. So we're like, oh, we want the best. We want all of this. Well, Mm. there were a few things that we didn't calculate incredibly well. So now we've got this network, we're building it out and there's additional things we have to add Which never happens in somebody's business plan, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Like you you have, it's like (laughs) entrepreneurial 
journey is uh, Mike Tyson said it well. He's like, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so you're going into it, and internet service providers are very much a, it's kind of like a cage fight because only have you're geographically confined. You know, so yep. if you're selling consulting, I can consult with anybody. And there's always people that have problems. And so there's not an infinite amount of opportunity, but there's a very large opportunity. We're doing rural communities. I've got 14,000 people that are here when school's in session, and I have to get as many of them as possible. And anybody that I don't get, somebody else has. And so there's not a whole bunch of newt. So that is my pie. And yeah. I have to fight over that pie with everyone else. But as far as fears, so we start off, we start off with the company and my business partner had put systems in place. You know, people are going to climb the towers. People are going to construct the towers. People are going to do the installations. And one by one, many of those systems didn't go yeah. like we planned. And so when one of them didn't go as planned, I was the one who got the joy of doing that. That's what real entrepreneurship, you, mean, yeah. you have to just, a lot of times you have to step in and just do stuff that you didn't plan on doing, you didn't expect to do, you may have yeah. not even necessarily wanted to do. And you have the capital that you borrowed and mm -hmm. you have the money that you've spent and now you have to start you have to start to pay it back. And so you have a burn rate. How long can we sustain while our expenses are way higher than our revenue when you're just getting mm -hmm. started? And so that creates pressure. We have to create revenue. And so or reduce expenses, all those different balancing acts what how do you adjust the knobs and dials of the, how the business runs yeah so one of the things was needed to climb towers and we're talking 100 and the tower our main tower was 150 foot tower so 150 foot tower our stuff was 135 feet up for reference that's a 12 10 to 12 story building yeah i mean that feels like the superman down at six flags yeah yeah so you're yeah so you're it's a ways up there and or realize that it's going to be prohibitively expensive for us to keep having people climb up there at the frequency that we need people mm -hmm. to be able to climb up there. So I have to do it. And so I go get trained and I'm like, all right, <laughs> looking up, <laughs> looking up at the, looking yes. up at the pole going, all right, I guess I'm going to do it. So I yeah. get up, I climbed up a few Several rungs. It was probably maybe 50 feet, not even 50 feet up in the air. And I was like, can't do it. Okay, we're going to do this. We're Get the 50 to, foot we're shakes. Gonna, yeah, we're going to try and do this tomorrow. And so it was a monopole. So you, it's very much like the traditional cell phone towers where it mm -hmm. just looks like a big pole on the ground with a bunch of stuff at the top. And they got spikes that are protruding out <sighs> at an angle. Ugh. And so the, that are your stair steps. And so I go back the next day to climb. And the there's a light halfway up for aircraft to see. And the power cable is draped. So there's a single cable that I latch onto to keep me safe, supposedly, to keep me safe. Oh boy. That is like a track. It goes straight up and down. Yeah. There's a power cable draped across that halfway up. So halfway up, 60 feet, 65 feet up in the air, I am taller than every single building. I have to unhook myself from the cable, put it Oof. Over on a but around the power cable and reattach it. Well, my first time doing it, my hands are shaking. Oh I'm yeah, so scared, and I drop it. Oh, so I drop. <laughs> this is like <laughs> one of my yeah. worst fears. Yeah. Like I'm yeah. up there with you yeah. right now. Okay, yeah. So keep so I keep drop going. It. So I drop it. Yeah, and I have to go down. Yeah, to I have to go down to get it. So now I have the, so there's these secondary things. You have hooks. You can hook on to different things to keep yourself secure. Well, I have to hook onto the only thing, which is these little rungs. And I'm looking at these little rungs going, they're strong, but if I fall, that's going to be a jolt. I don't know if I'm going to make it, but I'm going to hook on and be yeah. safe and you know do that stuff anyway. And I got you know I've got someone down below you know looking out for me, but yeah. he can't like so I have to climb down, free climb. Oh. Down, I get down, and I am like all sorts of shaky. Like if you like, just all sorts of shaky. Oh, yeah. So I take about a twenty to thirty minute break, and I'm like, all right, <sighs> okay, we're gonna do this again. So I get up there, all right, ready to make the yeah. connection. I got this, ready, unhook it, and my hand shaking, it falls again. <laughs> oh no. 
<laughs> and so, yeah, so it falls again. So now I have to free climb down again. I get down to the ground, and this is all... Like my brain, I can't function. And this like is I, all so that somebody have, can get their email today yeah, at home. Yeah. And so I just break down into a full blown panic attack. Oh, yeah. I'm like crying, like, un- I'm just like crying, like, I can't form a full sentence. Yes. Like, I could not string three words together. <sighs> I was so shaken up. I think I spent an hour, 30, 30 minutes an hour. I don't know how much time because my, wow. my adrenaline so much that time's going so slow 30 minutes an hour in the car and then i go back to the office and i lay down because i can't move i can't function my brain doesn't work yeah i went i drove home which was an hour drive from weatherford oklahoma city took a nap for two hours woke up ate something had a full night's sleep and then two days later i climbed again and made it to the top wow because it had to get done yes it wasn't just gonna do itself it doesn't do itself. Yeah. There's, so that was, and I still had the fear of heights. It wasn't like, oh, no, I figured out I'm done. I just had yeah. to get really good at managing my panic attacks. I learned that if I focus on the immediate task in front of me, which was the next mm-hmm. run, which was making this adjustment, this foot, here's exactly, I am like overanalyzing every single little rung and movement and foot movement and how mm. the pacing, because those are, they're multiple pieces. And so the rungs are not perfectly mm. manufactured. And so you have one where it's yeah. missing a rung. And so you have to double step up anyway. So, yeah, but I climbed towers for the next two, three years. It's amazing. That took you into your fear and you had to face it again mm-hmm. and again. You know, as an entrepreneur, you're an owner. And so uh, I think one of my favorite quotes of entrepreneurship came from Craig Rochelle. And he mm-hmm. said, so you guys are the ones who got tired of, of complaining about other people's mistakes. So you decided to go and make a bunch of, of your own. Mm-hmm. Other yeah. people can complain about mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I think that really hits home because at the end of the day, it does stop with you. You own it. Even if you have people working for you, it's still your organization. It's mm-hmm. still your company. It's still something that you're putting time into. Well, even like yeah. my, I, when we first, when we were installing our first house, and so we've got the contractors mm-hmm. out there, we've got the contractors out there and they're doing their first install. And we had hired an expert to come and show them how the process should mm-hmm. work for installs because they had done commercial installations, but not residential. And so we've yeah. got a residential guy, he's there, he's gonna walk them through everything. And I'm in the car watching them and I realize I'm not gonna know how good of a job they're doing unless mm-hmm. I know exactly what's going on with this process. Yes. So I'm, you know, in dress shoes and a polo and everything. And I'm like, I got to get up there and I got to go do it. Like getting on a roof, I'm that afraid of heights to where like, yes, I'm still there, but I'm up there in dress shoes, watching everything, asking questions, because I know at the end of the day, you can complain about the contractor or the person doing the installation, but ultimately it's going to be on me. It's going to be on me to make sure that this is done. And it's going to be on me to make sure that this is done well and efficiently and they're not necessarily, they're going to do what the instructions say, but they're not, if I don't know how to do this, I'm not going to know how to maybe improve on this system or make it faster. I'm not going to know how to optimize it. I'm just going to have everybody going willy nilly doing whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And in order for this to work, it has to be scalable. It has to be trainable. It has to be something that anybody can do. And I have to know how that works in order for it to happen that way. Yeah. And one other thing on it, like the stakes are really high as a business owner, so high that it makes you climb into your fear. It makes you climb to places that you would never do any other situation in life, except that it required that of you. If you were working for a company and they said, Drake, climb that, you probably would have left. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like the stakes are high when it comes to trust, when it mm-hmm. comes to opportunity, when it comes to all of those things going forward. Well, and yeah, that's the thing with most entrepreneurs. Let's be real. I'm afraid of heights, but I'm more afraid of failing. I'm significantly, I'm terrified of heights. Like I, my yeah. body has physical reactions to heights, but failing is, that's the biggest fear. That's what you don't want to fail. And it's important yeah. even, the, and this would be probably helpful for anybody listening, is, uh, you know, I was talking with another group. They were asking me to talk mm-hmm. about business and getting started. And they said, what do you do with that fear? And we need to... 
it's important to reframe and understand what fear really is. Just a response that your body creates going, this could be a problem. Yeah. If someone's coming at you with a baseball bat, this could be a problem. Your fear might be a good thing. Yeah. All right, so we've been talking through a lot of different aspects of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you again around the fear side because I think your approach to fear lends itself to how you walk through it and how you lead. And so, you know, to, to you, how do you think about fear? So there's two sides of it. There's the real, I'm feeling it right now, and then there's the abstraction of it. And if you understand what fear is, fear is mainly just your brain telling you, yeah. communicating with itself, this might be a problem. Yeah. You know, someone's running at you with a sword, that might be a problem. You need to do something mm -hmm. in order to survive. And it creates, it's meant to create some sort of action. However, it does not necessarily mean you need to change the action. It's just saying that there is a threat. And so the fear that you are feeling about something, for instance, when I was talking to some people about, I was speaking and they were asking about, you know, starting a business and how do you get over that fear and just make the, make the step. And it, realistically, it's not like the, it's not like everything is okay. If you're doing something that has risk, there's going to be some fear associated with it. Yeah. But you have to step through anyway, because it's not like once you get on the other side, the fear just stops. Like when you're running a business, there are plenty of things, there are tons of risks that you're always weighing, engaging, and there's unknown situations, and there are times mm -hmm. where you're just feeling like you're flying blind in the dark, just trying to take that next step forward. The fear doesn't necessarily go away, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, that it's bad. The person who isn't afraid is like a sociopath. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're just going through blindly. But it's important for you to realize, okay, what is this telling me? And it just gives you a moment to think about it, weigh the risks, and then move forward. Mm. Um, but just because you're afraid of something doesn't mean that that fear is justified. That's good. I was afraid of heights. I did not fall, mm -hmm. fortunately. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Um, that I didn't fall, but it was healthy for me to have fear mm -hmm. about the extreme thing that I was doing at the time. And so that's kind of how I look at it. I'm curious... What would it give more leaders to think more entrepreneurial in their business? When you say leaders, are you talking like high-level leaders or like mm -hmm. just any leader? Let's say across the board, but specifically I'm thinking about some high-level leaders that may be in, in a situation where they don't have all of the freedom that also comes along with the opportunity mm -hmm. to risk. But an entrepreneur thinks uniquely about things. An entrepreneurial leader thinks and is obsessed around opportunity and then what's the risk associated with that. And so, you know, what would it give that kind of a leader to start to, to lean in more? I think that I think that I think that it all depends on the stage in which that your business is in. We are living in a time of dramatic disruption that is happening across multiple sectors, uh, yeah. multiple industries. And it is easy to lead when things are comfortable, but it makes sense in my mind to be aware of where things are going and to take where things are going, try to spend some time thinking about what, where things are going, find people who are interested in where things are going, and using being able to test what they have. So if you have, a, if you have an organization right now, the idea is that you would have cash flow, and you have existing cash flow that you can use to put in um, to test new ideas. So if you have a company that's large and you're leading people, there, there may be a certain into the wind, into the wind direction that you may need to take. And it may make mm -hmm. sense to even segment off some of your employees to go that direction. But I think that some of the biggest things with entrepreneurship that, that you think of are taking responsibility. So there's an extreme mm -hmm. element of responsibility that you have where you know that everything starts and stops with you. Yes. And if you are in any sort of mid or lower level management that can mm -hmm. be incredibly valuable to where maybe your next promotion is due to the fact that you just took extreme responsibility 
over the process and you mm -hmm. said, here are my constraints and I'm going to just maximize everything I can with the constraints yeah. that are there. But if you're a high level leader, you it it would it's helpful to create a culture where you don't punish risk and risk taking yes. at a blanket level. Mm -hmm. Now there are some risks that are just stupid. You sure. look at that, you're like, that was a dumb idea. You're not encouraging that, but fostering a healthier risk appetite because mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the landscape of business right now, in 20 years, it's going to be completely different with AI coming in, with the change in demographics that we have coming with the boomers retiring and millennials, especially in Oklahoma, starting to move up power structures very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so at some element, you're either adjusting and improving or you're dying. And that's just the way it works. Yeah. Okay, so let's say someone's listening into this and they say, okay, Drake, like you've done the entire thing. You've taken a business from, you know, those early steps and a minimum viable product. Then you went and you got capital and you built it and you've climbed a tower <laughs> because you're so committed to it. And then on the other side, you sold it. And now like you're actually having time through the entrepreneurial journey. I call it the entrepreneur's reward of being able to actually step back and consider what do I want life to look like in the future and what are some of the things that, that I'm wanting to do. Mm -hmm. Let's say somebody's looking at this and they say, you know, this journey looks fantastic to me and I'm in a place where honestly, I don't love what I'm doing and I'm ready to start making a shift. Where does someone start? The best businesses that I've started have all have been started not with the idea, they've been started with the problem. Start from the problem that a person you know or multiple people are having. And you're looking at essentially the intersection of your skill set and where that intersects with what people need. Mm -hmm. And the intersection of that is where you can form a business. Yeah. Um, so for instance, like my first business, the guy needed a website. Mm -hmm. I knew somebody who could do websites. That intersection created an opportunity. Yeah. And so that I think is just asking people what they're struggling with. If you mm -hmm. have friends, if you really want to start a business, I would just start having coffees with people. And if you want to just find business owners or people you know that are business mm -hmm. owners, can't take you to coffee and just go interview them, come up with a list of questions. What do you struggle with? What What's something yeah. that's a headache for you every day? What's something that you wish you could do better? What's something mm -hmm. that if you could do this one thing or do these three things, you would get more sales? You yes. ask questions like that, and then you just solve their problems for them. And if you're able to solve people's problems, they'll pay you for it. That's the entire service economy is, I have a problem, I need somebody who can do this. And so yes. that's probably the easiest way because what I... For the majority of people, I would say try and start out with some sort of side gig and have some sort of side gig where you're helping some people on the yeah. side after work or whatever because it lowers your risk. It will reduce some of that fear. It can help you. I mean, everybody's trying to make more money. Yeah. So you can make a little bit extra money besides your job and you see, hey, do I like doing this? Hey, do I think I can do more of this? Hey, do I mm -hmm. think there are more people who want that? Nowadays, there are a million resources online yeah. to look up side hustles or side gigs or different things. I mean, you can do anything from email marketing to, you know, helping people put up social media videos. There's tons of stuff you can do as a side right. gig. That is what I would advise for the majority of people. And you start there with a problem. Find the problems. Yeah. And then build from that instead of starting with your idea mm -hmm. and then trying to find a problem to yeah. fit your idea. Yeah. yeah. Or even if you have, let's say you want a product. Okay, well, I have this idea for a product, which starting with the idea is not usually as good, but some people can do mm -hmm. it. You have a product. Can you 3D print that product instead of paying all this money to order mm -hmm. 5,000 pieces of it? Can you 3D print that product or the pieces of that product, put that together and then take it to people and say, hey, is this useful? Yeah, you know, they, I had there was my my girlfriend's my girlfriend's friend or no, it's her cousin cousin. Yeah, she, my girlfriend's cousin, she had a three D printer and she was mm -hmm. three she three D printed this little attachment for this 
wagon that you take kids around in. And she put it on TikTok and it first post blew up 10,000 wow. views. Ton, no, I think it's now up to like half a quarter million views or something like that. Yeah. And she found, she had a product, she cheaply created it and she just made a video about it and people loved it and people pre-ordered it. And so boom, instant business right there because she was able to test it small. Yes. Found that it fixed a problem and there were a whole bunch of people that were banging down her door to get it. Now that's not how every business starts. It's kind of like the sensational thing. Right. Not everybody may be banging down your door for your product right away, but if you can find one person that wants mm -hmm. it and help that one person, then they might tell another person. And, you know, we, the magnificent rises that we see yeah. are amazing, but usually businesses start slow. It takes 10 mm -hmm. years to become an overnight success. Yeah. And so I would say just take your idea or whatever you want to foster find find a problem if you don't know where to start find a problem or if you have an idea take those ideas to enough people mm. to where you try and see and it could be random strangers or yeah. it could just be like try and think about who where this might fit and then go to those people and hey yeah what do you think of this find the problem and then the power ultimately goes to those who keep showing up well yeah. drake thanks for joining us today on the Leader Growth Podcast. It's always an honor to, to sit down with you. Uh, you. I'm looking forward to having a coffee outside of this time soon. And to, to all of you who have joined us today, Leader Growth is designed to help you overcome challenges and experience transformation. And you know, one of the things that you may be interested in looking forward as a leader is we've created modern leadership. And the reason is a lot of you are overwhelmed with burnout, fatigue running throughout your team, and then some of the challenges that face you, like the digital transformation. You know, we were just talking about things things like short form media and how that can create some incredible impact. We're going to be sharing everything that we've got on this to help you grow as a leader. To find out more about that, go to leadergrowth.us. If you haven't yet, would you rate this podcast? Would you review it, subscribe to it, and share it with someone you know it can help? I'm looking forward to being back here next week, seeing you then. Until then, love hard, live full, and lead strong.